Well, good evening, everybody. This is Dean KK4DAS, BWS, uh, you know, Wireless Society Maker Group meeting for the 22nd of September, 2021. Thanks, everybody. Great to see everybody. Hope everybody's been making progress on their, uh, on their uh, rigs and their uh, projects. We have a, a special guest with us tonight, uh, Bill, Mur Bill Mira, N2CQR. He's going to talk to us in a, in a few minutes. Uh, Bill has become a good friend, uh, and uh, you may all know him from the Solder Smoke podcast, uh, which is kind of kind of homebrew heaven for those of us that like to listen to people talk about homebrew radios. He's going to talk to us about kind of one of his latest projects and help uh, uh, bust some myths about uh, why we use upper side band on some bands and lower side band on other bands and tell us why all the experts got it wrong all those years ago. So with that, let me turn it over to Bill. Well, well, thanks, Dean. All right, I, uh, Dean and I were talking, and I, you know, I thought I would, I thought it would be of interest to 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 you guys who are, who were building SSB transceivers, to talk about an SSB transceiver that I built during the same period that you were working on yours, and I've called it the myth the MythBuster, and I'll explain why as we go along. Uh, first, I just want to say it's it's really cool what you guys have been doing. I mean, the fact that you are taking on SSB transceivers. That's a major project. Frank Harris wrote a book, uh, and he in his chapter on on SSB transceivers, he said that SSB was the Nobel Prize of home brewing. So you guys are in Nobel Prize category here. The solder smoke listeners and readers have been following your exploits exploits with a lot of interest, and we I, I regularly include stuff about it on the blog, and we talked about it on the podcast. So uh, hats off to to all of you. Now. Uh, for tonight, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about myth busting and what is the myth. But I won't, I won't, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I'll just go through it quickly. Then talk about something that I call spontaneous combustion construction. And I see some laughter, laughter there. You guys know what I'm talking about. You're, you're sitting in the shack. There's a pandemic. Maybe your wife's, uh, you know, traveling. She's gone to visit her family. You have nothing to do in the house. You start looking around. You look at all those junk boxes you got there. And the next thing you know, you're building a transceiver, spontaneous combustion construction. That's sort of what happened with the MythBuster. I'll talk about this later, Rig, and I, I say it's a little bit Yesu, but it's quite a bit homebrew, and I'll explain that. It also evolved into what's known as an alfresco, what I call Alfresco Plus. I'm going to share with you some tales of woe from this project, and then talk about how if you know stuff, you can do stuff, and then we'll do some conclu conclusions and questions. All right, first, the myth. And Dean, Dean mentioned this. This is a, a, a kind of a core question in SSB history. Why do we use LSB below 10 megahertz and USB above 10 megahertz? We've all been doing it since we've been involved in the hobby. You go on 75 and it's LSB. You go on 20, and it's USB. But why? Well, I started hearing this explanation of it a long time ago. And here's the standard answer. Now, you'll hear this repeated almost endlessly by ham radio operators. A large majority of our fellow ham radio operators deeply believe this and will continue to believe it, even if you demonstrate that it's arithmetically impossible. They will still believe it. Believe me, I've tried. Here's the, here's the standard answer. Well, you see, because if you have a 9 megahertz filter and a 5.2 megahertz VFO, and by the way, that 5.2 megahertz VFO was readily available in the ARC-5 command set World War II surplus transceiver. So the guys had the 5.2 megahertz VFO. You take a 9 megahertz filter. The physics of mix mixing will put you obviously on 75 and 20 meters. If you take the sum, you'll be on 20. If you take the difference, you'll be on 75. And here's the best part. Because of the physics of mixing... On 75, you'll be on LSB. And on 20, you'll be on USB. And because of that happy arrangement, that is why ham radio operators since the 1950s, perhaps even the 1940s, have locked into this 75-meter LSB and 20-meter USB convention. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Isn't that great? I believed it for a long time. It just doesn't work. It's wrong. It, it can't work. And I'll, I'll briefly describe why. But it's still deeply believed. Now, the first part about how 9 and 5 will get you to 20 and 75, 
That's true. But the thing is, there's nothing magical that's going to create, going to allow you with one carrier oscillator frequency to magically come out on 75 LSB and 20 USB. And that's the core element of the myth. That's the element that they say explains why we are on 75 LSB and 20 USB. And it's, it's just, it's just not true. So it's, it sounds good, but in fact, it just doesn't work. And here, look, I just drew a little picture here. Well, first of all, I'll say this. The myth is built on a misunderstanding of a concept known as sideband inversion. For the myth to work, one of the, those two frequencies, either the sum or the difference frequency, has to be inverted. And one has to stay the same. That way you get on 75 LSB, but 20 USB, right? So that's a core element. For the myth to work, one has to be inverted and one not. So I, I always say that when you're thinking about this, you should keep in mind to keep it straight in your head because it's hard to do. You think about this and you don't think about it for a few months. You go back and think about it again, boop, you're all messed up. Here's the way you can remember it all the time. And I call this the Hallis rule. It's from Joel Hallis, who used to work at AWRL headquarters. He taught us and correctly taught us that sideband inversion only occurs when in a mixer, you subtract the signal with the modulation from the signal without the modulation. That, these are words to live by, my friends. Only get sideband inversion when you subtract the signal with the modulation from the signal without the modulation. Subtraction is not enough. It has to be subtraction of the signal with the modulation from the signal without the modulation. Okay, so let's take what, what actually happens in this mythical rig. This is the rig that they claim explains the convention. You have, L you have an LSB signal generated at 9 megahertz. So you have your filter at 9 megahertz, and you have everything lined up, so you got a 9 megahertz LSB signal coming out, and it's mixed with your VFO, which is running around 5.2 megahertz. So I've marked the signals with modulation in red. The 9 megahertz signal has the modulation. The 5.2 megahertz signal, that's just your VFO. You've got your LSB signal coming out at 9 megahertz. Let's look at the first case. You have 9 megahertz minus 5.2. Yep, you're on 75, 3.8. However, look, there's no sideband inversion because you're not subtracting the signal with the modulation from the signal without the modulation. You've got the reverse. No sideband inversion. So you're still on LSB, right? Okay, so far, so good. You wanted to be on LSB on 75 because that's where we started. But then look what happens on 20 meters. You're taking the 9 megahertz signal with the modulation. You're just adding it to the 5.2 megahertz signal. So obviously, there's no going to be so, no inversion there. Come out with 14.2 megahertz, 14 megahertz, no sideband inversion. You're still on LSB, all right? So this, this, you cannot use this kind of rig to explain why we are on 75 LSB and 20 USB, all right? So that's the myth that was busted. Um, I, got a little, well, I got a few little charts. I'll only go through one because I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I'll leave you the other charts so you could sort of look at them if you want to look at it from a different angle. Here's the chart I drew up, drew up this morning, busting the myth. Okay, here's the 9 megahertz signal generator, and here's what an LSB signal would look like coming out of this thing. You have 9 megahertz carrier. It's suppressed, all right? So I have a kind of a dotted line there. And then you have the audio extending down, you know, 2.7 or 3 KCs below it. It's an LSB signal. Goes to a mixer. You mix it with your VFO, 5.2 megahertz, perhaps from your beloved ARC-5. And this is what you get. 9 megahertz with modulation minus 5.2 megahertz. You end up with 75 meter LSB. On 20 meters, you're just adding the 9 megahertz with modulation to 5.2, and you end up with 14.2. Again, LSB all the way through. The myth does not work there. Now, here's the myth buster. If you reverse the frequencies of the VFO and the sideband generator, then it does work, okay? But this is not the rig that they cite when they're talking about the origins of the convention. They always cite a rig like this. It's like a unicorn. It's cited a lot, but it doesn't really exist, right? Here's the one 
that is the correct way it works. If you have the sideband generator at 5.2 megahertz, and say you have it running on USB, you set it up, you got your filter at 5.2 megahertz, you got your carrier oscillator, boom, you got a USB signal coming out. There's the suppressed carrier at 5.2, and then extending up above it, 2.7 or 3 KCs, you have the, the, uh, the frequencies that represent the audio USB signal. Comes to the mixer, look what happens here. Here you're taking the 9 megahertz signal that does not have modulation, and you're subtracting from it the signal with the modulation. Now, in this case, the 5.2 megahertz has the modulation. So we go back to Hallis's rule, right? Sideband inversion occurs only when in a mixture you subtract the signal with modulation from the signal without modulation. Down here, that's exactly what's happening. The signal with modulation is being subtracted from the signal without modulation. So you get inversion. So here you take a USB signal, boom, you're on 75 LSB, my friends. That's where you want to be. Look what happens on 20. You're just taking the 9 megahertz signal from your VFO, could be from an FT101, which is the case in, 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 my, in my rig, and you're combining it with the USB modulated signal here from your USB generator, and you end up at 14. There's no, there's no, there's no uh, free sideband inversion here, so on 20, you're on USB. As we say on the Solder Smoke podcast, Bob is your uncle. You're in good shape. This is what you want, all right? And so when I, when I was thinking about this, I decided to build a rig that would demonstrate that this would actually work in the second case, okay? So I'll, I'll describe now a little bit about the, uh, the rig itself. But I've got a couple other diagrams here, and I'll just leave this. this. This talks about what goes on in the receive case. I'll leave that with you. You could take a look at it. And our fellow home brewer and my, my friend down uh, in, in southeastern Virginia, Dino Pappas, KL0S, he wrote up a chart that describes exactly the same thing, but in his way of thinking about it. And, and I think with home brewing and understanding the theory, sometimes you have to draw a chart that works for you. <laughs> Obviously, it has to be consistent with arithmetic and the laws of physics. It is in the case of Dino's, but it's just the way he thought about it. So he brought, drew up this chart, and I'll leave that with you, but it demonstrates essentially the same thing. All right, now a little bit about spontaneous construction, com uh, combustion construction. Pete was right, as he said about your projects, the radio does not build itself. In other words, you have to get in there, got to get your hands dirty, got to get some, some, you know, some solder burns on your fingers and go in there and build it and struggle with the hardware as you've all been doing. It looks real easy. I lo how many times do outsiders who've never done this say, oh, well, just, yeah, just throw in a filter and throw in a couple amplifiers and it'll be fine. That's all you have to do. You'll notice that these folks have never done it themselves. If they have, they know it's not that easy. It's hard. All right. Spontaneous combustion. I mentioned it before. I find that sometimes the needed parts and ideas seem to gather in my shack leading to spontaneous combustion construction. And that's sort of what happened with this Mythbuster rig. Here's how the ideas and parts gathered. Now, I want to say, I too believed the myth for a while. I did. It sounds so good. It, it's a perfect explanation. Oh, that it was true. I believed it. About 2012, a friend of mine sent me a nine megahertz filter. And I held that beautiful filter in my hand. And I thought I can easily make a 75 meter LSB and a 20 meter USB rig without even having to switch the carrier oscillator crystals. I could do it. And I actually put, I talked about it on the podcast, how I was going to do it. And I put a post on the blog about how I was going to do it. And then a friend out in California, Steve Snortroz and Smith, set me straight. He said, uh-uh, that's not going to work. That's when I started to, to understand that the myth was a myth, that it just doesn't work. If you reverse it, it works. So now, how I got to a point where I had something where I could reverse it. Uh, during the pandemic, I built a, a rig called a Q31. It's a shortwave broadcast receiver. And I, the reason I built it, because Pete Giuliano sent me this beautiful capacitor, a variable capacitor out of a Galaxy 5 transceiver from the 1960s. But this capacitor, this variable capacitor, just was a thing of beauty. I loved it. And I built a rig. I really built the rig around the capacitor. So Pete was on the lookout for something similar 
And one day he sends me an email. He says, hey, you should buy this part. It's got a great capacitor. It's got great gears. It's got anti-backlash in it. Buy it. Buy it just for the capacitor. So I, it's always good to follow Steve's uh, Pete's advice. Boom. I hit the pay key and I bought what I thought was just going to be a variable capacitor. The box comes, I open it up. Yeah, the variable capacitor's there, all the gear works, everything's there, but it's attached to the VFO box of an FT-101. And it is pristine. It's perfect. I flip it over, there's three wires coming out of it. One for the clarifier, one for the output, and one for the, the, the six volts in. So I test it. I put six volts in. I put the scope on the output. Perfect, beautiful, stable. The thing works. And I think, oh, man, I got to use it. I can't just chop this thing up and use the, the capacitor. I got the, I got the whole VFO here. And it's the kind of circuitry I like. It's all discrete components. There's no chips in there. It's very simple circuitry. And it's really stable and really nice. So I said, that's when I started looking around for a rig to use it. And pretty quickly, this... This 9 megahertz VFO and a 5.2 megahertz signal uh, SSB generator came to mind. February 2021, we're deep into the, the pandemic. It's cold outside. My wife buys a treadmill. Treadmill comes. The guys come and install it. It's got these 5 millimeter plywood sheets in there. They're about ready to throw it away. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, leave the treadmill, but leave the, the plywood, please, too. And they looked at me like I was nuts. Nobody had asked to keep the plywood before but I had ideas for the plywood. All right. And then finally, a little bit later in the pandemic, I'm doing my pandemic walk through the neighborhood and somebody's thrown out a pine board sitting there on the curb, grabbed that thing, brought it back. That became the base of the Mythbuster rig. I built it on the pine board. All right. And I'll show you here in a minute. But anyway, these are the parts and the ideas that we're kind of gathering in the shack. A little bit, Yesu. There's the, uh, there's the, the, the part that Pete told me to buy. So in that box is the entire Yesu FT-101 VFO. It's got a reduction drive. Behind this, this dial, you'll see there's a couple other gears. There's anti-backlash gears. It all goes and drives a nice variable capacitor that's in there. It's a thing of beauty, a little bit Yesu, but quite a bit homebrew, okay? So look, here's what it looks like from the top, all right? You can see here's the, uh, the, the Yesu VFO that I've kind of put at the center, and then I built this rig much the same way that you guys built your SSB transceivers, stage by stage. And that's an, a very important part. And you can see how I built it on individual boards. And as the boards got finished, I would just screw them down onto the pine board that formed the substrate. I made sure that I had a good ground plane. and you'll see there's some copper tape that runs all the way down the center, and that provides a good ground plane for the whole thing. But you can see the various stages, like here's the mic amp for the mic input. Here's the audio amp output. Um, what do I got here? Oh, here's the uh, the carrier oscillator. And here we have the, uh, the balanced modulator product detector. This is a, a termination insensitive amplifier on one side of the crystal filter. I built a 10-pole crystal filter at 5.2 megahertz. I found some crystals on Mauser. They were like 5.242, close enough. And here's another bilateral termination insensitive amplifier here on the other end. Then uh, I have some TR switching. Here are the, uh, the, uh, the bandpass filters. You guys have been talking about bandpass filters, one for uh, 75 and one for 20. I have one double pole, double throw relay in there. Dean, when I was at this point, Dean told me, yeah, you should use two filters, one here and one here. But at that point, I only had one filter in my junk box. So I said, okay, I'm only going to use one, double pole, double throw, with one, one pole handling the input, one whole pole handling the output. I know they're too close. There's a potential for bleed over, but I tested it. It worked okay. And then down here, this whole side I left kind of reserved for RF amplifiers. So you have the first stage of RF amplification. You Here you have the driver, and then it goes, here's the IRF 510 on a nice big heat sink that I actually cut a hole for and put on the outside of the box. Here's a switchable low-pass filters, one for 75, one for 20. Um, the mixer, you can see it right in there, the ADE-1, a tiny little mixer, first time I ever used one. 
It's kind of a, it's kind of like an SBL one, but in a small package, it's just a diode ring with tiny little coils on both ends. It's really pretty cool. Work fine. All right. So just, um, I'll describe some of the features and because you guys have been involved in, in SSB transceiver construction, I think this is the kind of audience that would really appreciate this stuff. And believe me, there aren't too many folks out there that would. I chose a 10 pole 5.2 megahertz crystal filter because it would give me steeper skirts. You know, when you, when you plot the, the, the band pass mm -hmm. on, of the filter on your nano NVNA, nano VNA, sometimes they're broad skirts. Sometimes they're straight up skirts. Now, we were on the air with guys who were running SDR rigs, and they take great pride in their nearly vertical skirts, right? That's why you see on the waterfall these, like, very, very, very vertical, you know, you know signal paths showing the SSB signals. Um, I think you could do this pretty much the same if you, you have uh, enough poles in your filter. So I, I, I chose 10 poles, which is more than you usually use, to get steep skirts to make the SDR guys envious of my S, uh, of my uh, crystal filter signal. I use TIA amps, termination insensitive amplifiers at both ends of the filter. This provides a stable and predictable impedance at both ends, all right? Independent of what is on the other ends of the amplifiers. This is a, a circuit that Wes Hayward developed probably around 2009. It was, it was used earlier in other rigs, the bidirectional filter idea, but the termination insensitive amplifier Farhan kind of asked Wes, how do I do this? And Wes designed this uh, termination insensitive amplifier. I talked about the ADE1 mixer. My mic amp, when I got, came time to build the mic amp, I just needed, it's a standard mic amp. So I just looked around and the micro bid X had a nice mic amp in it using a 2N3904. So I just took what Farhan did. It worked in the micro bid X and I just, boom, I just built a micro bid X mic amp and put it in there. For the balance modulator and the product detector, I used a circuit that I use a lot. Doug DeMoy used it all the time. Uh, it's two diodes and a trifilar toroid. Toroid. It's not doubly balanced. It's singly balanced. But that's all you need, really, in the balance modulator and the product detector, and it works real well. Key point, only one crystal used in the BFO carrier oscillator. That's the key point, because that, that, that is what the myth promised to do. You wouldn't have to switch to two crystals, right? And it wouldn't work in the myth, but it works in this one. It works in the myth buster. Uh, I used no RF amplifier in the receiver. And again, I was following the lead of Farhand here with the micro bit X. In Farhand's earlier bit X rigs, he did include RF amplification ahead of the mixer. He did it in the, in the, 20, in the bit X 20, and he did it in the bit X 40 module. But when he went to the bit X, um, micro bit X, he dispensed with that. And I think that's sort of the current thinking. And if you don't need an RF amplifier ahead of the mixer, you're better off without it. And I found that both on 75 and 20, I did not need it. So I didn't build it. All right. I use a cheap little LM3X36 amplifier board that you could buy on, on eBay. You get 10 of these things for 11 bucks. It's like a, a surface mount LM386 already soldered onto the board, already with the capacitors, cheap, easy. It's a bit of cheating. That's why I say quite a bit of homebrew, but heck, if I'm going to use the VFO from the Yesu FT101, I might as well use one of these little LM386 boards, 10, for 11, 10 of them for 11 bucks. Now, I also, these are other, other boards that I just, just use, SanGN frequency counters. I'll, you'll see a picture. I have two frequency counters on the front panel of this, this rig. One is set up for 20 and one is set up for 75. When I throw the band switch, the 20 meter one lights up and shows me the frequency on 20. I put this, the, the band switch down to 75. I get the same effect for that band. So it's a good way to get uh, uh, band indication. And then finally, an IRF 510 power amplifier with a big heat sink. Somebody sent me the heat sink. It's perfect. I, I could run this thing with 24 volts on the IRF 510, in which case the, that bigger heat sink would really be necessary. But I haven't been doing that. And I, 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 I could, but I don't. I, now I just have a big heat sink there. More is better than too little. So in the heat sink department. All right, here's a, look, I got a, I had a, a block diagram. We've already described that this is the transmitter. Now it, it's bi-directional. So the receiver is very similar, but 
the mic amp I talked about. There's the AD1. Uh, this is the oh, this is the two diode singly balanced uh, homebrew uh, balanced modulator. In this case, carrier oscillator. Tia number one at about 23 dB gain goes through the 10 pole crystal filter. Tia two also at 23 dB gain. I measured the the insertion loss here, but I don't really even remember what it was. It it it. I don't think it really matters that much because I can hear the band noise on both bands, right? I have enough gain going all the way through. And when I connect that antenna on the back, boom, I can hear the band noise. The noise goes up, which means that I have enough gain in the receive system. But we're talking about the transmitter here anyway. Then it goes to the to the mixer, ADE1, that little chip. A friend of mine gave me one a while back. I, I always like to use parts that somebody gave me because it sort of get, adds kind of soul or personality to the rig. Then the bandpass filters with the relay, I described that before, then three stages of RF amplification, the final, and then a relay that switches the low-pass filters. That's the transmitter. It's very similar. It's similar to what you guys did with, uh, with, with, with uh, Pete's uh, simple SSB rig. It's very similar also to the BIDX rigs and the BIDX. All the bidirectional rigs are like this, okay? So anyway, here's what, we, what I mean by Alfresco Plus. This is what it looks like in the box. Now, the, the plywood is the stuff that came from the box with the treadmill, all right? Here are the two Sanjian frequency counters, and I've got the band switch up in the 20-meter position, so the 20-meter one lights up. If I was to put the switch down, this one, the lower one, would light up and would show a frequency on 75. In the beginning, I was just using, this is the uh, the frequency readout from the FT-101. I don't even look at this thing anymore because I got these nice blue glowing numerals. Glowing in Giuliano blue, by the way. Um, here's the main frequency dial. Yeah, this little piece of screen is another thing I found on a, when I was walking, on, my, on, the, on the walk in the afternoon. I had just cut the hole for the speaker in here. And heck, I wasn't going to stick any pencils in there, so I didn't need it a screen to protect it. But I found this thing in the street. It was about the right size, brought it back, cut it out, sanded it down a little bit, painted it black. Boom. It looks pretty good. I think here's the audio gain control mic in. Okay. So, and again, the base is the, the wooden base that started out as sort of just an alfresco uh, proof of concept kind of prototype board, but it was about the right size. And I just built this cabinet around it. The numbers mean nothing except they look kind of cool and techy. I, I, it sounds like it's a technical manual of some sort, TM something or other. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have my I run it off a little regulated power supply down below. All right. So tales of woe. You guys are talking about tales of woe. I'll tell you a couple things that went wrong. Now, I built each stage and tested each stage. So when you do that, everything should work when you put it together, right? Well, yeah. But it, it didn't in this case. The receiver receiver always comes together first on these rigs, or usually does. And Farhan advises when you finish the receiver, stop, take a rest, and then enjoy just listening to the receiver that you've built. And then go back a few days later and finish it off by building the RF amplifiers and the remaining stages in the transmitter. So that's that's what I did. Every time I use a relay, I put diodes across the coil of the relay because when you snap that relay off, there's back EMF that comes up. And if you put the diode on there, the, that back EMF, the, the voltage and current goes through the, the diode to ground and not through your circuitry destroying the circuitry. So I put these back, I put the back EMF diodes in there and I put capacitors, sort of a a belt and suspenders. You put a put a 0.1 microfarad cap across there too for the same purpose. So I was being a good citizen. I was doing what I was supposed to do. But when I hooked it up, when I hooked it all together with the trans transmitter circuitry in there, every time I hit push to talk and put the thing in the transmit mode, it pulled an ungodly amount of current. It pulled like five amps through the power supply. It would blow fuses. Uh, the power supply would 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 reduce. It was a mess. So something was gone. Something had gone wrong. I knew the individual circuit boards were okay, but a couple of things could have gone wrong. I could have blown the final. We blow up a lot of IRF five tens. The IRF five ten could have been conducting to ground. So I just started isolating it back. I started removing from the circuit, going back from the power amplifier, back, 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 and then all of a sudden I went back one stage, keyed the mic. 
and the power draw was normal. And what it was was one of these back EMF diodes that I put it in put in there was shorted. So when I when I keyed it, it would pull current to ground instead of just blocking it like it was supposed to. I replaced that diode, everything was good. And it was, it matter, it was the troubleshooting was just a matter of, of kind of going back and isolating stages and watching for when the problem stopped. I had one other problem, one other tale of woe, and that was an intermittent loss of signal on transmit. I finished the transmitter. I took care of the first problem. I started calling CQ. I grabbed my D104. I proudly sat back, called CQ on 20 meters. And then right halfway through the CQ, I noticed that the SWR meter the power out meter was not jumping up anymore like it was supposed to. I was pretty much talking to myself. Then I'd click it a couple times, go back, call CQ again. Again, it would be going great. Boom, it would drop out. That's not good. That's that's one of the most frustrating kinds of problems because it's an intermittent problem. It'd be better if it was like that all the time that you could just go in there and fix it. But it's intermittent. So when you go in there and try to find it, you have a tough time finding it. It's hard. So Dean and I were joking about this. With this kind of problem, one of the things you could do is just go in there and start tapping, tapping around pop, 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 while you're watching the power out and see if there's something loose. Pop, pop, pop. And then all of a sudden, boom, I hit it, and I could see that close by one of the toroids that was in one of the drivers, I think it was the toroid going to the pre-driver in the RF amplifier. When I tapped it, it would the power would go out. When I tapped it the other way, the power would go down. So the problem was in that toroid. And I pulled the toroid out and looked at it. And the, the problem with these trifiller toroids is that you've scraped off the enamel so that you, make, you can make the connection. If you scrape off too much enamel, you create the possibility of a short. So some of the, wire, some of the, some of the, the wires were coming in contact when it should have been just enamel to enamel coming in contact. So it was shortened to ground and my RF wasn't getting to the amplifiers. It was just going to ground. That was the cause of the problem. So I pulled out that trifiller toroid, put in a new one, and the problem was gone. And so I was, I was in business. So these were the only tales of woe that I had with this thing. There were far fewer problems with this rig than, than, I, than I had with previous SSB transceivers. I think this is the benefit of experience. As you, as you do these things more and more, you have fewer and fewer problems. Now, they never go away. Pete will, will tell you, and he's told us many times about problems that he's had, and he's built almost 40 SSB transceivers, but he still will run into problems that drive him nuts, all right? It's just, it's just part of the game. And I think the best advice I, I heard about this is that if you get into one of these problems and you can't fix it, just leave it alone. Put the thing on the shelf for a day or two. Take a walk around the block. Do something different. Get your mind off of it. Often you'll wake up, you know, early in the morning and think about it and you think, wait, wait a second, how about that? Then you'll go in and you'll see, yep, you, it, it occurred to you. You can't, you can't keep beating at it or else it's not, you're not going to be able to come up with a solution. It, it take, it, it, it's worthwhile to take a break. Um, and the, I guess this gets to what Pete always says, if you know stuff, you can do stuff. And the, the knowledge you get from building these rigs you know, and being part of the International Brotherhood of Electronic Wizards and sharing information in, in forums like this one really, really helps. Um, the conclusions, my conclusions from this whole project, the Mythbuster works great on both 75 and 20. I have many, many pleasant QSOs with it. It was fun to build and ended up with very few tales of woe. You do get better with each project you complete. I consider the myth truly busted. But here's the thing. We still don't know where the LSB-USB convention comes from. I know it doesn't come from that rig that they describe, that mythical rig, because it couldn't possibly work. But we still don't know where the convention came from. And we've I've had there's a lot of people out there searching and nobody can come up with a with a really plausible answer. The search, the search continues. You know, about this rig, if you guys are interested in this, I got a lot of information on the solder smoke blog. And as I did it, I shot little videos, four or five minute videos on each stage. There are 17 videos. Uh, about the Mythbuster on the Solder Smoke uh, YouTube channel. So um, I don't know. You guys have any questions or comments? We we, we could talk talk about it. I'll stop the screen. I'll leave the screen sharing up in case I want to go back. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Lee, I've got a copy of the first edition of Single Sideband for the radio amateur from 1954. Right. 
And I was looking through this, and nowhere in there can I find anything that describes um, why upper side ban or lower side ban the convention. Yeah, I know. That's one of the things. You, you, and this is, you know, be, this, go, you know, this it, goes back to all the early QSD you know, articles. It, it, it should be big news. And it's not in there. It's not in there. The first reference we see is in the second edition, the next edition, which comes out, and I think it's like 1965. There's another edition that comes out. And they, they have a line in there that says, over the years, there developed a, a vague species of convention, all right? They don't point to any decision. They don't point to any specific rig. They just say that that's something that kind of developed over the years, but how or why it developed over the years still remains a mystery. And, and, and you're right, Lee, if you go back and you study the literature, you don't see any announcement in QST saying this is the way we're going to do it. You don't see anybody saying, oh, this is the way the ITU or the FCC said we got to do it. No. It's not there. So it, it, it's and, and also it doesn't even show up. There's no good explanation in terms of the rigs they were using. Because the rigs that they were using back then all had sideband switches, so you could go on either sideband on any of the bands. Correct. So it's still it's still a mystery. So yeah, my other comment is, I think commercially everybody uses upper sideband. All maritime mobile is USB. I think yeah. all the aeronautical mobiles USB. Yeah. I, you're uh, right. In the military, uh, uh, Curtis LeMay went for USB early on with the, with right. the Collins rigs, very early, with Strategic Air Command. Unless like, you get right. really fancy military stuff that has independent sideman and right. you know, all right. that but, stuff. But with, the, with like the KWM-2s and the S-lines that, that LeMay got into, he told everybody to use upper sideband. Now, there's a good reason why they wanted lower sideband on 75. At the time, 75 was really the main phone band. There was some phone activity on 20. 40 was still CW only. So really, if you were a phone guy, your main interest was 75 and a bit of 20. On 75, the sideband guys liked to hang out at the very top of the band, close to 4.0, because they knew the AMers could not go up with their carriers that high because their upper sideband would extend out of the band and they'd be getting nasty mm -hmm. notes from the FCC. However, if you were a single sidebander, you could go right up to 3999 and use lower sideband and have all your energy below the band limit. So that's why the, the kind of the upper, 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 upper portion of 75 meters became an early hangout for sidebanders. So that is one plausible explanation for why they would want LSB on 75. But there's no real uh, – uh, the same logic should apply to 20, right? There's no real reason why I, – I haven't been able to see anybody explain why they would want to be on, on upper sideband on 20 when they wanted to be on lower sideband on 75. The same logic should apply to 20 meters. Seems like you want to switch. If you're at uh, the upper end of the band, you'd want to go lower. If you're at the bottom CW and you want to go upper. Well, I mean, at CW, it doesn't matter. You're just on one, one, one frequency. You don't, you don't worry too much about the sideband. But but on sideband it, it does matter because you're extending either way and, and you know this when you when you kind of like if you're on upper sideband on 17 you got to stay away from that upper band edge because if you think ah ha ha I can go up to 18.167 sorry you're on USB you're going out of the band my friend I mean a, a lot of a lot of folks don't understand, don't don't get that and they do it but so but it, but it so it, it makes sense on 75 it would make sense on all the bands because the up the, the the phone portion is the upper portion of the band but for some reason. Reason that we don't understand yet, they went for upper sideband on 20 and on everything above 10 megahertz. So a couple of months ago, Bill, I was uh, tuning on the lower part of, uh, on the extra part of the 40 meter band, and I was getting Donald Duck. And I'm thinking, my sideband is correct. I'm on lower sideband, and I could not tune them in. And so I switched to upper sideband, and there were a couple of guys having a conversation on upper sideband on 40 meters. It's legal. It just confused the heck out of me. Well, maybe they were getting maybe they were getting close to the lower band edge, and they decided to go to upper sideband to stay out of trouble. They're, they're entirely within their rights. I used to run double sideband. When I first got into phone, I was running double sideband rigs. When I, I was out in the Azores, and I built double sideband rigs. They were great fun. And it was great fun because sometimes you'd get some guy come on and say, hey, hey, old man, you're on the wrong sideband. And you'd say, no, no, sorry, I'm on both. You're okay. That would really blow their minds. 
So I ran the double sideband for a while. And then I built my first single sideband rig because I decided that it was more socially responsible to, to not use up twice the, the necessary spectrum. So I built an upper sideband rig for 17 meters. There was a community of guys that were always, we were always talking to each other. And when I, when I first put the upper sideband rig on, one of these guys came to me and actually said, Bill, Bill, there's something wrong with your transmitter. You're, you've lost your lower sideband completely. And I, I said, hey, thank you very much, because that was the whole idea. <laughs> Bill, I've got a question for you. Sure. When you power your individual boards, do you run both a, um, a V plus and a ground twisted, or do you use that copper plate for your returns? I use the copper plate. I, I think on, on many of the, the bidex that I built, the, on three of the first bidexes that I built, or two of the first bidexes that I built, I used just one copper board, and so that was ground, and and everything that was powered was above ground. So I, I guess I got into the habit of doing that, and that's the way I that's the way I do it. That's why you saw that in that picture, you saw a strip of copper tape just to make sure that all all the um, all the different copper clad boards are electrically together and have a good ground plane. So I, I, I do it that way, yeah. Do you run your uh, V-pluses through any toroids or just go straight from your rail to wherever it needs to be? E each of the circuits, each of the, the, the VCC lines on each of the boards usually has some pretty serious bypassing on it. They usually have 0.1 capacitors to ground. They often have electrolytics to ground. And you're also often running it through a 10-ohm resistor before you get to the power line so usually I, I, you don't have to think about it too much because usually each of the circuits that you're using has incorporated quite a bit of bypassing and when we say bypassing we're just trying to make sure that the only thing that's on that 12 volt rail is 12 volt dc you don't want any rf going onto that thing because you're opening yourself up to feedback and your amplifiers will become oscillators and then you will be living in a tale of woe. So it's it's good to have, it's good to almost overdo it with the bypassing. And I think that that is one of the kind of the, the bits of tribal knowledge that you learn. So all of these circuits, if you take a look at, if you take a close look at the picture that I, that I have, and you guys will, will get the, the slideshow, you'll see lots and lots of bypass capacitors on the rails the 12, that mark the 12 volt line for each of the boards. And I, 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 went, I went through a time where I had a lot of problems with feedback. A lot of amplifiers became oscillators. But then when I started paying more attention to bypassing, to keeping the 12 volts on those 12 volt rails really free of RF and even audio, then those problems started to appear less frequently. If you had to come up with a standard reference uh, architecture for us, you would do a 0.1 microfarad to ground yeah, and this is yeah. I think I think almost everybody when they're working in HF uses a 0.1 microfarad to ground, usually a ceramic disc capacitor. All right. And then there's 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 some disagreement about whether you should also run an uh, kind of an electrolytic, say a hundred a hundred microfarad, two hundred microfarads or more to ground. Certainly, in like around AF amplifiers, you see people doing that because there's a danger of AF getting into the 12 volt supply, and then you can get audio feedback. Um, some people say, "Look, if you're putting 200 microfarads there, point putting an additional 0.1 microfarad to ground is kind of <laughs> pointless." But people do it, and it's a, it's a, it's a practice that has kind of developed. So I. I would just take pay attention to whatever they have in the circuit. Make sure there's enough there to prevent any of the AF or RF energy from staying on the 12 volt line. So no wrapping your no wrapping rep your power rep supply wire through a toroid. Um, yeah, I think I mean that, there you're getting into kind of a, a choke, and that that takes place. You have a, I, I definitely have a, a choke going into the uh, the power amplifier, the IRF 510. There's a choke there that goes in that keeps the RF from getting into the 12 volt circuitry. So certainly there, and I mean, I, I guess it depends. If you if you if you build a rig and it's and it's working fine and you're not seeing any problems of, with feedback or anything, then you really don't have to do that. However, if you start running into trouble, then you start kind of remediating by adding things like that by by putting 
additional chokes in there to prevent. You're just trying to 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 break the what the the the, the oscillation criteria, the Barkhausen criteria that Pete always refers to, to prevent that circuit from providing a loop that provides for for oscillation. I think that's the main the main problem. Sometimes you'd use additional chokes, but it depends on the circuit, depends on what particular board you're working on. We found that in a couple of cases with our uh, with our simple, simple SSB, you know, we've got the Arduino, we've got the SI5351, we've got the LCD, and sometimes we pick up noise from those circuits and the noise comes in on the power line. So it was actually one of Pete's suggestions to to take, you know, kind of one by one, go through the, the DC feed lines and wrap a couple of turns. Um, yeah, right. it, yeah. One one thing I'd say about operating here in Northern Virginia, this is a very RF intense environment. There's a lot of RF here. I mean, I have a 50,000 watt FM transmitter. I can see the antenna about two miles from my house and I've got uh, an almost equally powerful AM transmitter down the other direction. So you got to be careful because a lot of times these these signals will make it into your rigs around here, and suddenly you'll hear kind of classic rock coming through your 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 rig, and you realize that it's from the FM transmitter up the road. So, um, I mean, I I don't use a lot of shielding. Look, I've used plywood here, so I I get away with that even in this RF intense environment. But there's a lot of shielding in the circuit itself because I'm using toroidal inductors, and those toroidal inductors are self-shielding. I use a lot of um, of small gauge coax to interconnect, so there's not a lot of long wires that could pick up RF. I think that kind of shielding is really important. It's it's important to use the right kind of small RF or small coax. I get the kind that has Teflon core, 50 ohm. Because if you use the stuff where the core melts, it'll melt, and then you'll have all kinds of trouble um, sooner or later. So uh, it's it's worth it. I think it's RG three sixteen I use as as an interconnect primarily because it's got the Teflon the Teflon dielectric. And when you do the interconnect, um, are you, do you also uh, uh, solder the braids to ground? Yeah, you know, and the braids are the braids are 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 terrible because the braids become what we know what we call Murphy's whiskers, right? So you cut that little piece of coax, and then right away some little pieces of braid fall out. They fall into your circuitry. They're going to short out exactly where you don't want it to. It'll it'll mess you up. So you got to be careful to keep little pieces of braid from falling in there. But I do twist the braid. I try to solder it away from the board. That'll take care of some of the whiskers. And then I just I do solder the braid where, where where I can to the copper clad board, and then keep a can of that you know electronic dust off around, and just blow it in the area to make sure that you blow out any little pieces of braid that might have fallen in there. You know, there's a kind of coax that doesn't have any braid; it just has like an external um, uh, aluminum steel kind of kind of uh, coating that serves as like the the shield. And there's no braid involved at all. I forget the the RG specification, but I've used that too, and it's nice. It's hard. It's harder to work with, but it gets you away from the Murphy's whiskers from the braid problem, which is a, a good problem to avoid. So I've I've used that. I don't have any of that around. I'm using using RG RG three sixteen, and you'll see that when you look at the pictures of the of the um, of the MythBuster. Let me see if I can find find it. You'll see see what I'm talking about. It's it's kind of hard to see. It's kind of a cream colored. Oh, well, you can see there's a little piece of uh, kind of ordinary. Uh, so, so I have coax. a question. So for doing all those coax interconnects between the modules, it looks like you're just soldering the coaxes. Yeah, right to I the board versus doing SMAs or something. I don't do it as neat coax. as you guys. I'm 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 really in awe of your SMA work and your connectors. And I know you have a guy who who helps with that, but I. I and, and I think that's a good way to do it because it makes the modules easier to connect and disconnect. But they I, take up uh, a I lot of space really, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. They do take up a lot of space, and they it's take, an added it, complexity. So and they, add, I'm, they, I'm add, they add work, fence. They add work to it too. So I, I, I've just been soldering, and I've been doing that for a long time. But, but uh, um, there, I think there's an advantage of having those kinds of connectors too. Now, look, there are people who are really, really kind of fanatical and kind of 
uh, kind of, well, fanatical about shielding. So there are people that with a rig like this, they would build every single one of these stages in its own little shielded box and then have connectors on the outside. And then you connect the whole thing together and then you could be sure. But man, that for me, that's just too much. I mean, it's, I mean, I know there are stages where you're better off shielding them and I've shielded them in different rigs, especially around VFOs and things like that. But it adds a lot of work, and it makes it a lot more difficult to service. This, with everything above the board, it, it's very easy to service. You don't have to flip over any boards. In the old days, when we used to etch and solder on the bottom and have the parts on the top and then solder traces down below, man, that was a pain because every time you worked on the board, you'd have to flip it over, flip it back, flip it over. You did that four or five times, the wires would break, the coax would break. Ugh, it was terrible. I I, I kind of like this. This is all Manhattan construction, by the way. These are all little pads that are glued to the top of PC boards, right? So there's there's nothing. There's no etched. You'll you'll if you look closely at the boards, you'll see where I cut out little squares of PC board and super glued it to the board. So this whole rig is built with Manhattan construction techniques, and that's my main technique. I don't I you know I I've done printed boards and everything else, but. But I, I do it with the Manhattan construction technique. And for me, it works. It's simple. It's fast. And it's easy to work on. I could go in there and pull a part off and put a new one on in a minute. Whereas if it was a kind of a printed circuit board, remove the board, solder it out from underneath, worry about lifting the pads, worrying about breaking the leads. For me, this this works better. Hey, Bill, as long yeah. as you're on the picture. Um when we were building our, started building our simple sideband re- transceivers, uh, Pete really discouraged us from trying to build an IF filter. You just kind of said, ah, I bought all these crystals and built my IF filter. You kind of just went through it like it was no big deal. So <laughs> is, that, is it really no big deal? Because Pete kind of discouraged us. He said it would be a big deal to try to build a good one. I mean, Pete and I have differences of opinion on, on, on different things. Like, for example, he's a big fan of the SI5351. He does not like analog VFOs. He's made that very clear. Mm-hmm. And what you just mentioned is another area where he he's a believer in kind of factory made crystal filters. I, I I like these kind of crystal filters. Now it's hard to do. It's harder to do it this way. It's more perilous. You might end up not getting it to work exactly the way you want, but you get better at it over time. The the trick is. You have to, when you buy these crystals from, say, Mauser, 5.247 megahertz, Mauser doesn't give you all the parameters that you need. You need to determine the, the emotional inductance and the emotional capacitance of the CM and the LM, the, 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 the degree to which that, that quartz crystal also acts as an inductor and a capacitor. You have to measure the plate capacitance. You have to determine the uh, the series, the equivalent series resistance and the Q of the particular crystal. Then you go to some software, you plug in all that data. And usually I use some software from AADE. There's a number of other crystal design software packages out there. You plug in the data and then you start telling it, okay, I want to use 10 of these crystals. I want to use it in a cone topography. And I want to match it at either end to 50 ohms. And then it will spit out a circuit with the passband that you've called for with those particular crystals and tell you how to match the impedance that exists at the endpoints of the filter with the 50 ohms that you want to go into your TIA amps. And then it will actually tell you how to construct the matching network to match them. So you'll see in, in this one, you'll see I have two little toroids here on either right. side. Those are those are impedance matching transformers that take what is the characteristic impedance of the filter and match it to the 50 ohms that works best into the TIA amps. I would say it's possible to do. I mean, I've built many of these things, and I'm no I'm no wizard. I'm not I'm not an engineer or anything like that. It's just it's all just ham stuff. But you could do it, a lot of people do it. I wouldn't be deterred. It's rewarding. It's it's difficult. You have to do some measurement, and then you have to make sure that it that what you what you've built actually conforms in terms of pass band and uh, kind of filter shape to what you want. But it's an opportunity to use your 
your nano VNA, and Dean has done this quite a bit, where he looks at a filter, sweeps it, takes a look and see what it looks like. It's um, it's probably cheaper than using store-bought crystals or store-bought filters, but it, I think it adds another element of, of homebrew to it. I mean, I, my feeling is you should try to build as much of this stuff as possible, and that makes it more and more of a truly homebrew rig. This one is, for me, quite a bit far from pure home brewing. I mean, because I'm using, hell, I'm using a, a VFO, VFO from a Yesu FT-101. Nice. This is like dealing with the devil here. I mean, come on. And I, I've got a, a board over here with a, a surface mount LM-386. I hang my head in shame. I mean, but, you know. But you've already done that other stuff before, so you know you can do it. I, that, that, that's what I tell myself. That's what I, I tell know. myself, Mike. Sorry. Thank you for yeah. saying that. No, I, I know. I, I do that, too. <laughs> So, um, yeah, you can can, can do it. How how hard is it to measure those uh, parameters on those crystals? It's not hard. There's a a method called the G3 UUR method. You build a little device, and all you really do is you switch in 30 picofarads, and you measure the frequency before, you measure the frequency after that. From that, you can calculate the CM and the LM, and then there's a way that that uh, that Chuck Adams has developed to determine the equivalent series resistance in the Q. Once you have those numbers, and then the, the plate capacitance, you just measure the capacitance across the, the terminals. Once you get those numbers, then you go to 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 some of the software. There's there's Dishal software out there where you plug these parameters in, tell them how wide you want the crystal, how how wide you want the filter, how many elements are you using. And it'll spit out a schematic saying, okay, build this. Then you build it, then you measure it, and it might be a little bit off. And then you, you start tweaking and you get it to where you want it. But it it's it's satisfying. And I I'm really pleased with this this filter. I wanted it tight. So it's it's it is tight. It's not hi-fi, it's not, it's not broad. It's at about 2.5, 2.6 kilohertz, kilohertz wide, and the skirts are SDR steep. Oh, that's good. That's we had. That's ours was two point four, I think, Dean. At two point yep. eight. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you get guys going a lot broader now, but I, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's. it's oh, I, yeah, uh, well, that explains it because yeah, you kind of blew through that just like it was. Oh, no big deal. I built an IF filter. So it's <laughs> well, a lot more behind the scenes. So I looked at you. that. I looked at that test circuit <laughs> and and Bill for the first time, home brewer. That test circuit is as complicated as our entire well, no, but, no, no, no. But you're 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 looking at W1FB's crystal tester. Yeah, and I, I had the same reaction. That's not what I'm talking about. G, the G3 UUR circuit. Just check it out. Just okay. do a Google search on G3 UUR crystal cir- circuit. I mean, look, I, I, I have one floating around here. It's just a little board. It just, it just, you just, it's a switch that switches in 30 picofarads. And then you measure the the oscillation. Oh yeah, crystal parameter thing. circuit. Yeah. yeah. So you you also can do okay. it with a spectrum analyzer and a tracking generator, which is what I did. Yeah. I have a little text f- test fixture. I put my crystal in, and then substitute a little hundred ohm variable resistor to get the series resistance, and um, it's not that hard. I bought like a hundred crystals for ten bucks. <laughs> Yeah, off eBay, and I went through and measured them all and <clears throat> sorted them out. So I got all the approximately correct, you know, series resident frequencies were all about the same. And then I was able to use the dish all software and, and I built some filters. Yeah, you, you could do it. There's, there's a lot of they, different they ways to do it, well. depending on what kind of gear you have. But the G3 UUR method and Chuck Adams, yeah. th- th- and then you go to the software and you know, you gotta, you kind of go go back and forth between the software and then what you build and you measure it, and you test it, and everything else. Yeah. And so, for example, I built it the first time and I found it was a bit too narrow, so I, I changed the the series capacitors. I bought some additional capacitors. I think I lowered them in in capacitance, and that caused the filter to broaden out a bit. Now, one thing to know that if you look at it, if you look at when you sweep your fist crystal and you see that the pass band is jagged. That indicates that you've got bad matches at both sides, right? If you if 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 you've got if, if you're not providing the kind of impedance that the filter wants to see at both ends, then you will get a jagged pass band. Whereas if you get a nice smooth flat pass band, you've got it properly matched. So these are the kind of you know kind of tricks and things you, the problems that you learn to to look for and you realize okay 
my pass band's jagged. It's probably I have a bad match at either end. I got to work on that a little bit. Or it's too tight. Uh, maybe I'm using crystals, bypass capac- capacitors to ground that are too high. I need to lower them a bit, broaden it out a bit. I, I went through a couple different iterations with this. That's why you can see the the soldering around the crystals. It's, the board's a little bit messed up because I soldered parts in and then took them out and then soldered different parts in. Bill, do you have a, uh, a closer picture of that filter? I, you know, I don't, but I have a, I have a whole video. If you go to the, um, to the YouTube channel, you'll see a video on the construction. I think it's, it's the first, Mm -hmm. first, this was the first stage I built the first thing I built in this one. And I did a a whole video with, with, I think better pictures on it there. Did you uh, ground all your cases, Bill? I did not. I know guys usually do that. I I never have. And it, it, it it seems it, it didn't seem to make any difference. It's interesting. Um, this, the, so we went through a whole process when we were kind of getting ready to do this because the filters we were going to use were from the GQRP club and they ran out of them. I remember and that. So yeah. We had to yeah. do a search and we got a guy in the UK that built filters, but he looks like he basically did what you did to build the filters. I mean, his filters look, they, they look virtually identical. Yeah. And um, uh, um so, but I went through the same process with Pete. I said, well, why don't we just build them? I said, it's just one more circuit. And he's like, no, you don't want to do that. He says, you got enough, well, you, well, you, but, you, but, you got enough problems already. <laughs> but, but he might have been, he might have been thinking that you're dealing with a group of folks who haven't built a rig like this before. That's exactly right. And in that case, I mean, it, it is better to avoid problems. And, and, and you know, later on, you, you could, you know, then do it. You, having having put together a whole rig and got it to working together with the commercial filter, sure. And then later on, you know, go and try to 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 roll your own. In this case, in this case, it was good because I would have a tough time finding a commercial filter at 5.2 megahertz, right? But I wanted a filter at 5.2 because I wanted to sort of prove this MythBuster concept. Mauser had the the crystals at 5.247. I bought like 20 of them. And I knew I would use 10. I've got 10 of them sitting in the bag over there. I could, I could probably build another 5.2 megahertz crystal filter if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. What, I, what I found was some of the extra crystals is what I use for my LO oscillator. Yeah, well, that's it. One of them, one of them is down here. One of those, one of those yeah. additional crystals is down here. And it's, it's, it's the carrier oscillator and the, uh, the BFO. I picked one that, that happened to be a little bit in the direction where I needed it. And then I put some, uh, I think, a coil and capacitor in there to move it to exactly where I needed it. Now, as you guys have found out with your rig, when, you, when you're when you setting it up, the placement of that carrier oscillator or BFO in relation to the pass band of the filter is critical. This is what determines whether the, the rig sounds good or not. A lot of times you'll hear guys who are you know fooling around with bid X rigs. They'll say, oh, man, I built it and it just sounds terrible. It sounds awful. And then you ask them, well, how much attention did you pay to the placement of the carrier oscillator frequency in relation to the passband of the filter? And you find out that they just, well, they figured that whatever came out of the box was okay. They didn't spend a lot of time on it. Whereas if you do that, it'll uh, it'll pay off a lot. Now, when I was building my first sideband rigs, I didn't have a whole lot of test gear. And I actually had a, fr- I was in the Azores and I had a friend in in Sweden SM4 FQW. And we were talking and I said, I said to him, listen, I need to adjust my carrier oscillator frequency. And I need you to listen from Sweden and tell me when I get it right. And he said, okay, okay, okay. And I got my little screwdriver with the trimmer cap and I would call SM4 FQW. How's this sound? Terrible. How's this sound better? How's this sound better? How's this sound? Worse. Go back. And we, we did that a few times. Huh. And that's how I adjusted the, the location. Now, believe me, there are better ways to do this. But, I mean, that's essentially what I was doing. I was moving the carrier oscillator in relation to the unmovable passband of that crystal filter. So, guys, for us, we do that with the Arduino. So we set the... Right. That's, that done nice in the, <laughs> that's done in the sketch. Um, yeah. uh, but the important thing for us is to make sure that you got the center frequency, of the filter plugged into that sketch so that when you do those offsets, they actually work uh, the way they're supposed to. 
That's right, yeah. So we, that's the other thing. Pete, Pete definitely has an aversion to uh, analog uh, VFOs because I told him, you know, the next thing we're going to do <laughs> is this double side, uh, this direct conversion. And I said, I think we'll do a VFO. He's like, why would you want to do that? You know, just use, just use the SI 5351. Well, one, of, one of my points was, hey, Bill, uh, Pete, I haven't built 50 transceivers and I've actually never built a VFO. So it might be it's a, a new, interesting learning for me. It, it is fun. It's it's not. It, he's right. There's uh, you know it, it has its ups and downs. It's it's a bit hit and miss. But when I built my Bidex twenty uh, transceiver, I wanted to build it completely analog, completely chip free. So I built a I built a VFO in there, and that's uh, that's a VFO. Now now a halfway house that you could do when you're getting started, and this is something that Doug DeMore always recommended, was a VXO, all right? Get a, get a crystal and then use a coil and a cap in series with the crystal to move it. So you're building an analog variable frequency oscillator, but there's a crystal there that prevents things from getting too far out of control. Now, you, can, you can't move it too far. And, you know, I think it's like, you know, you could move it like, 10 percent or something like that either way maybe more but um i i have one i'm using one on 17 meters right now i have a, a, a my oscillator is a crystal oscillator at 23 megahertz the if is at five megahertz right so subtraction gets you down into the 18 megahertz range but i i have two crystals in there and with those two crystals i can cover the entire 17 meter phone band and it's um, it's it's an you interesting gotta, you way to switch go. One of them in at the top end, and another end at the bottom end. Yeah, and I have a panel switch on the front, and I just I just throw it. I'm throwing it right now as I'm talking to you. And when I notice that it, that okay, I can see on the little Sanjian readout where I am, and I want to go down a little bit lower. I throw it one direction, and there I am. But it's 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 an easy way to do it. Doug Demore really recommended it, and he said it's especially useful if you're building a rig that's going to be for portable operation where you're going to be out in the cold or the heat or something like that. You have a VXO in there. So it, it might be, that might be something to look at. One thing I'd advise is if you're going to do the VXO, get the crystal as high as possible in frequency. So that way, I mean, I started out with this rig, the crystals were at 12 megahertz. I couldn't move them that much. So then I went up and I used at 23 megahertz. I can move them a lot more. Of course, you got into the sideband inversion problem in one way or another, but that that was that was a different story. Yeah. So my comment about the the better capacitors is go look for old surplus stuff like Arc Five radios. They have really nice gear driven, worm gear driven vacuum variables. I mean, boy, vacuum, not vacuum, just variable capacitors in them. I'm I'm guiltily I I I have a fondness for the capacitors out of the Heathkit QF one Q multiplier, and I have destroyed several of these fine pieces <laughs> of vintage radio equipment. I, well, I I, I think do. if you want like say a, a nine megahertz VFO, then um, something like the ones of these variable caps of an arc five would cover like nine to nine and a half easy yeah but i mean if you got the arc five if, if you get that thing working the whole vfo is worth keeping worth keeping right there that arc five vfo i mean that was what was people were using back in the day and uh yeah i mean if you get one that's complete junker you can pull the capacitors out of it but you might end up like i am with this thing where you, you go for the to buy the capacitor and you end up keeping the whole vfo yeah well yeah, you know, there's the uh, the circuit to use. Um, I think people claim the stabilist VFOs are what Vackers, V A C K E R. Yeah, the Vacker VFO that that was good. Then you get the series tuned claps. There's a whole bunch of different circuits, but um, Pete, one stable. of the one of the things that Pete hates about these kind of VFOs is that depending on the capacitor, depending on the circuit, if you get it up at one end, the frequency gets kind of squished together, and a small movement results in a big frequency change. But it is possible, as is the case in this VFO, where you have a, a fairly linear dial readout. That's not mm -hmm. a problem. The other odd, really odd thing is, I haven't tried this, 
is if you want a really stable one, long-term stability, use a vacuum tube instead of a transistor, like a 6CW4 Navistor. And the reason is transistor characteristics drift with temperature. Tubes do not. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, this is, these are other tricks. I mean, I, I, I think if you just, ironically, if you leave the, the transistor out of the box, leave all the heat producing active components out of the box and just let them just sort of vent their heat and let the heat dissipate, things stabilize quite a bit. And I, I've got I, the, the VFOs that I've built with transistors have ended up being really, really stable. I mean, there might be when you first turn them on, mm-hmm. when things are getting hot, they mm-hmm. might drift a little bit, but then they'll stabilize, and then you've got you got some pretty stable VFOs. I mean, it's not SI fifty three fifty one stable, but if you could live with, you know, ten hertz drift during the first fifteen minutes, if you can get past that, I, for me, I, I I like it better that way. I mean, I, they, they should be actually quieter, 7.201 right? Two hundred one exactly. If you're not on 7.201 exactly, the frequency police are going to come get you. <laughs> I know, I know. They're, they're very cruel on 40 meters. They're cruel. Yeah, but they should they're have lower frequency. <laughs> yeah, but you should have lower phase noise. Yeah. Which is one of the issues with all the digital based. Bill, just a quick one. Are you happy with the uh, audio chain going out to your speaker? Yes, I am. And I, 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 this is, this is something that I kind of learned or relearned from my building of the, of the Q31. In the Q31, I, I had one stage of audio amplification from, uh, I think a single BJT or an FET. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't remember. But then, and then it went right to an LM386. I, and a lot of people complain about the LM386. I think it produces superb high quality, high volume. I got more audio than I need. And there's so much audio gain in this thing that I don't really have to worry too much about IF gain or insertion loss in the filter or anything like that because you only need about 100, 110 dB from the antenna to the speaker. And I got more than enough. I'm running this thing with the uh, with the, with the, the speaker, the volume control, nowhere near the top. So I think, I think it's fine. I, I mean, I, I like the LM386. I don't generally like chips, but I like the LM386 because it's a simple op amp. And if you want to, you can understand how everything works in there. There's no digital magic or lines of code or 3 billion transistors inside a black box that you'll never understand. It's, it's, it's simple enough to get your head around, and which, which makes it kind of more acceptable for me. But yeah, I, I like the 3 LM386. I know there are better amplifiers, but man, that little board, if you look on eBay, 10 of those boards for 11 bucks. I mean, I've got. I'll be. I'll be building. I'll be building a lot of rigs with these little little AF. So speaking of the LM three eighty six and your audio, do, you know, we uh, Dean thankfully put an AGC circuit in here because we. I've noticed, you know, you, you really have to ride the volume knob. I mean, do you have any kind of AGC built into yours? You know, I, I followed Farhan on this. Farhan from the beginning, the in the from the bid X twenties on, he was he just would say. I don't put AGC in this. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's a, 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 a frill. You could turn the gain control down if you want. And I have over time been tempted occasionally to try to put AGC in my rigs. I never have. I may do it one day because I do. I, it, I recognize that it helps with, uh, with, with the ability to handle large signals. It, it helps with the dynamic range of the receiver. Right. But um, it, it adds a level of complexity that I don't think it's really necessary. So I'm sticking with Farhan on this one. When he goes AGC, I'll go AGC with him. It only takes two transistors, Bill. <laughs> or an op amp. Tap the beat about or an op amp. And a fat. I, I, I use and, and For that reason, I, I never have any S meters in these rigs because the S meters are usually derived from the AGC. So people will tell me, Hey, am I S six or am I S seven right now? And I'll just look and I'll say, "Well, I think you're S seven, old man. You're doing real fine." <laughs> well, well, we had a problem with the, the simple forties because we have so much. I know the, the the three transistors we have up there driving 
the fourth audio transistor, by the time we get out of that, strong signals, we're actually clipping our 386s. We got so much audio. Yeah. Uh, I thing- mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that's one. Of, I don't know whether you guys have an RF amplifier ahead of the mixer. I don't know. Yeah, that's do. the, I was wondering. We do. We mentioned that earlier. That might be part of our problem because we we do have an RF amplifier going into the first. Mixer. Or, or the other thing we may have need to do is maybe we should put a switchable attenuator in. Switchable in attenuator is great. That's better. It's almost like a. It's almost the equivalent of an RF gain control you could have in there. Some guys even build. You know, they 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 are able to turn down the IF gain, RF gain, IF gain, and AF gain. That might be overkill. But a switchable or, attenuator yeah. would be good. But I, I never have I never really experienced clipping with this thing. And I think part of that that is that there was really no need for RF amplification ahead of the mixer. Well, and you don't have a we also have an an, an amplifier, tra- a transistor, a 3904 or a six in front of that. So I've often wondered if we couldn't just remove that and just use the 386 by itself. Yeah, I think a lot of times people like the LM the, the transistor before it because it, it, it kind of reduces the noise. Usually, usually see an LM three eighty six or another op amp with a with an with a single discrete transistor right. ahead of it. I True. think that's for the that 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 establishes the noise parameters there. And um, and, and again, you're you're feeding the output of the mixer, so you maybe not want to put the mixer directly into the high that, impedance. Yeah, that's that's probably another reason. The other thing that you do here, yeah, is from, that's from, true. From from pin one to eight, you know that sets the gain. Mm-hmm. And if you put a ten microfarad cap across <coughs> ten to eight, that that greatly increases the gain. If you remove the cap, it greatly reduces the gain of the LM three eighty six. What I did with this one is I ten when I put ten microfarads there, it was way too much gain. When I had zero microfarads in there, it was way too little gain. So I, was, I think I found a, a five microfarad cap halfway. And even though it's surface mount, I went in and soldered that cap across pins one and eight and kind of tailored the gain from that LM386. So looking at pins one and eight on an LM386, you can you could you could move the gain of that that op amp around quite a bit. That's something you might want to look at. Yeah, we do we, I we I had I clipped it off and I still get too much gain in that audio amp. Yeah, I think Mike, you probably are the same, and Dean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have I have it on, but that's but now that I have the I ADC a, in there, it works. Oh, okay, yeah, because I couldn't. Yeah, I was it was driving me nuts. I clipped it off, and now it's sort of okay. And maybe may, maybe even play around with the uh, the pot that you have going going in there. The in, the pot input, you might need to just put some more resistance in there, so it has to go through more resistance until before it gets to the LM three eighty six. You're just changing basically the range of your AF gain control. I don't know. It's kind of these are the kind of fun projects. This is great. You guys yes. are getting into this. That's what I was just going to say. This is this is kind of the point of you know, the, the kind of the beauty of Pete's design with all these little modules is like you don't like this audio stage, you know, yeah. do whatever you want, build your own, right? I don't know if you guys realize how rare this kind of conversation is among hams. We're probably this is probably one of the only groups in the United States right now that's doing this, if not the world. It's just not happening a lot, and it used to happen at every club meeting every week in every radio club across the country, there were groups of people that were interested in this technical stuff at this level. So I think it's terrific. And I am going to, I am going to rejoin BWS for like the fifth time just so that I could be part of this group. I think it's going to be great. I, I first, I first joined back in 92. So I'm an old timer. Um, hey, it's been great. Thanks very much for inviting me, Dean, and thanks thanks to everybody. Thanks, Bill. Thanks so much thanks for sharing. Yeah, Check out you, the, uh, the the Solder Smoke blog and the, and the links at the end. You'll you'll see them there, and I, I think that might give a lot more detail on each one of these little boards. But I really enjoyed talking to you guys, and hope we can continue. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we're thanks, everybody. About the meeting, uh, Bill. Thanks so much. Uh, I have your slides. They haven't changed since you sent them to me, right? So no, they have. I'll send you an updated version. I'll send me the updated one, and then I'll, I'll pop them up on our our share drive for the guys. And I will send you a link to the video as soon as it's ready. All right, I'll send. I'll send you. I'll send you the slides right now, Dean. Good night, guys. Thanks very much. Super. Good night, everybody. Good night, Dean. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.